Hello and welcome to another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast, a discussion about writing and other things. Recorded live at the 18th Annual Florida Writers Conference, I am your host, Allison Nissen. Hello and welcome to this edition of the Florida Writer Podcast. Today, I am lucky enough to have with me Caitlin Johnson. Caitlin, she happens to be a super secret agent. And she's going to give us her 60-second elevator pitch about who she is and what she's looking for. Hi, I'm an associate agent at Corvisier Literary Agency, and I'm looking for upper middle grade, YA, and select adult. Usually it's everything from fantasy, contemporary, light sci-fi, ghosts and paranormal. I really just don't take nonfiction, mystery, suspense, thriller. Everything else, throw it at me. So how did you get started as an agent? I wanted to be an editor first, actually, and I went to Emerson to get a degree in publishing and interned. I ended up getting a remote internship at Corvus Hierro and I just stayed and I kept moving up and they sat me down and were like, well, what do you want? And I realized you can kind of do the best of both worlds with agenting. Um, I can edit and be all nerdy, but I can also kind of have a say in what books are going out and the books that I'm noticing aren't available. I can find the writers and I can bring new talent out. So I figured, you know, I want to edit things that I have a say in what I'm editing and that I love to edit rather than just get thrown things and edit what I'm supposed to edit. So it just kind of happened to me. How is the market for middle grade and YA? Is it flooded? Or do you find that there's a ton of submissions? For, for YA, there's always going to be like a ton of submissions. YA is always going to be this big pinnacle moment now. Um, I think middle grade's the next wave. That's me personally. Can't quite speak, speak to the market, but for me, I think middle grade is going to come up just because there's still so much we can navigate with that and so much more we can trust the readers with. I just think there's like so much landscape that we could explore and middle grade hasn't been trusted with that just yet. All right. When you say it hasn't been trusted, by whom? I feel like there's a lot of, because we're still kind of in an old wave with publishing. We're still testing out new things we're waking up to ideals that a lot of us are like it's about time like yes finally you're taking this um and in middle grade you know it was always hiding things from kids sometimes or not thinking they were smart enough for certain things or that they couldn't take deeper emotions and stuff in that and we're we're really opening up now saying we get it you can take these themes you can understand these storylines and it's okay if it's not all fluffy happy we want fluffy happy but it doesn't all have to be that. And so I feel like with middle grade, we're going to get a lot more historical. So you can see some of the things that have happened in history that kids don't know. Or we're getting, going to get more LGBT in middle grade. And we're going to get more dealing with grief and stuff like that. So kids kind of can understand what they're going through and learn how to get through it rather than be walking blind through a lot of situations. That makes it really interesting when you're looking for things that will help create the next generation of adults and we can look at what where we are with adults right now and think okay we have some work to do yeah just I, a bit <laughs> the landscape is like wide open right mm-hmm. yes yes absolutely so i've got a question about querying okay what are you actually looking for i mean what do what what's your ideal client when you get that perfect letter that comes across your desk what is it going to say that captures you right away For me, it's literally telling me what makes your book unique. Like we all, you can give me a romance plot that can apply to 50 different romances, but I want to see what makes yours different than all the other ones on the shelf. So whenever I get a query that pulls me in immediately to what that unique aspect is, I'm like, okay, this writer obviously already knows what's special about their book. And they know how to tell other people what's special about it instead of, you know, rambling and going through all the amazing facets that they're in love with in their story. They can actually just target that one specific thing. So I'm immediately like, okay, I want to look at this. And in the pages, it's when the voice is so 3D that I just, I can feel like I'm there. I can picture it. I could picture it in a movie or something like that. And so then I'm like, I will, I'm going to request this because it's that strong a piece. Um, So when I'm querying, I'm literally looking for that. I know we say hook all the time and everyone's like, what's the hook? And I'm like, it's what makes you unique. Not you. Well, you, not you, your story. What makes you different than all the ones on the shelves right now? And how many do you weed through before you find ones that you're actually? (laughs) There's not really any number for it. I have a very big maybe list. Um, So 
because I can't request them sometimes if I have too many submissions I already have to read because I my, my anxiety will like rock it up. So I like hold myself back. So then if I finish one, then I'll go request a maybe from it. Um, so my maybes are like, maybe the query wasn't the greatest, but I really liked the concept and I thought the pages were decent. Or I super, super liked the query, but I didn't have time to go look at the pages really deeply. So it depends. I mean, I, we get, depending on how big an agent you are, you can get anything from 10 to 100 queries a day. So like, you have a lot to slog through. You re And that's why we call it the slush pile. It's not the nicest name, but we are literally swimming through things. Um, and you just never know when the gem's going to pop up. So I feel like I find a maybe like one in every 10, one in every 20 maybe. Um, the ones that are like obvious no's are the ones where word count's clearly not been researched or it's a genre I don't represent. They're not following the guidelines. Um, people who don't send me a synopsis and say see above because it's not your query. It's different. Um, those are like the obvious ones are the ones that get canceled the like earliest because they're not doing the work that is necessary behind it. They're not doing their homework. So if they don't respect me enough for that, why should I respect them enough to be like in depth going through this stuff? following those rules. I, I've been a college professor. It was always, you, you got to follow the rules, people. Yeah. And it's not like they're to pigeonhole people or like make a writer conform to something. It's literally so I can get through them as fast as possible. So you're not waiting a year for me to answer your query. If it's following my guidelines, I can get through them much faster. I'm not having to stop and go slower and deal with problem people. So like, it's not, we're not mean about it. We're just like, this is, has a reason behind it. So do this agents from the same agency have different guidelines? Yeah, we do. Um, like I, my, for me, I like the synopsis. I make it mandatory in my submission materials. Not everybody else does. Um, some people will just say, I don't care about the synopsis right now. Just send me your query and pages. Um, and we're all taking different things. So we're all asking for new things. So like, in our profiles, we will list a bunch of the stuff we take, but we have actually started listing things we don't take because people will kind of ignore a lot of it and just send us everything. And I'm like, no, no, no. Here's what we don't take. Because we're all so different that it gets confusing when you want to really figure out who's the match for you. If we don't put what we don't take, you could miss a shot because you queried one agent, not the other. Do you ever look at a work and think, this one isn't for me, but it would be perfect for my next door neighbor? Yes. We do it all the time. Um, I share with Courtney Price at the agency. Saritza and I go to a lot of conferences together because we're both local to Orlando. So we will sometimes request the same thing. And, and so sometimes I'll be like, all right, Saritza has it. So I'm not going to request it because if she thinks it's not for her, she'll send it to me. So we do that all the time at Corvus Hero. And I mean, Eric Smith just recommended another writer. He, he recommended me to another writer. We're not in the same house. We're not anything like that. And she sent me her full and I'm so excited to read it. So like we do that all the time because we know agents are hard to get to know as the general public. You don't get to have FaceTime with us. We don't get to like interview everybody and talk to people. But agents do talk and get to know each other. So sometimes we're the best avenue for understanding who might be the better fit. How many conferences do you go to a year? I try, like, I think this year I did eight or nine. I try to do some, like, every other month um, because I don't want to get overwhelmed and I still have to, like, work. But, and I don't want to do back-to-back -back weekends, but I still really want to do them because I want FaceTime with writers. I want to actually be able to see them and talk to them and... At the very least, if I don't request it or want it or something like that, I can give them feedback on it. Like if they pitch to me, I can help them learn how to pitch. So it's a, I feel like sometimes it's a better way to really just give more feedback and give them an experience of what it's like and help them with public speaking sometimes because they're also nervous and they're shaking. And I'm like, I'm nice, I promise. I, I went to my very first interview for, with the query and I sat down and I looked at the gentleman across the way and I said, never done this before. What should I do? <laughs> and like, that's what we're there for. The big thing about pitching is a lot of people think that when they, they buy these slots or if they're free and they come and sign up, it's like their end all be all. They're there to get signed. And that's not true. It should be there. You're get you're there to get their insight on your concept, on your pitch, on your query letter. You're there to pick their brain. Like it's not necessarily about, I'm going to pitch it to you and I just want an agent. Like you, 
you're there, there's so much more you can gain from it. So I love when people come to me and they're like, I don't have my book ready yet, but here's the concept. And I wanted to talk to you about the industry or I wanted to talk to you about editing stuff. And I'm like, fine, if you're not ready to pitch, that's fine. But we can talk about stuff. I don't mind that. I've heard that the relationship between an agent and the writer is a little bit like dating to marriage. So you start off with the idea of you're dating. It's, you know, got to be right for both of you. And it's not until you you know that it's right for both of you that you make the commitment, sign on the dotted line. Exactly. Um, Which is why, like, I always tell people if an agent's offering to you, have a list of questions ready. There's a bunch of articles, like, on Writer's Digest and online that can tell you kind of what to ask. Um, and if the vibe's not there, like if your personalities don't match, it's okay to say no. Cause like I could love your book, but maybe I'm not the right person to champion it. Maybe I'm the one who's just going to buy it when you put it on the shelf and like tell everyone how much I love it. So you have, you really do have to. And the same goes for an agent. Um, a writer could really, really love the agent, but not agree with the edits they want to do. And that's okay. You don't have to take the edits. You can... Find someone who really loves the book and doesn't want to change certain things like that. So it, it's it's a two-way street. You have to be comfortable and you have to trust them. What's the quirkiest thing that's happened to you as an agent? Oh, that's the hard. super secret agent. <laughs> that, that is really hard. Um, I feel like some conferences I go to and there's a lot of where they actually don't realize I take what they take. So they're, like, telling me their stories and stuff, and then they're like, oh, but you're not interested in that. And then I tell them, and they start freaking out. And they're like, oh, my God, yes. I'm like, Calm, breathe, breathe, calm down. Um, I don't think a lot of, like, weird things have happened to me at conferences. I've been pretty, like, blessed with conferences. I've had really good experiences at most of them. I know I love the ones where I can take a nap in the middle of the day. <laughs> but, no, I've, I, I don't think too much weirdness has happened. Yeah, I feel, I wish, I feel like I'm not interesting now but (laughs) do you find that people are afraid of you yes and I hate that I'm nice we're all nice like because at the end of the day we're not there to say no to you we want to find a great story just as much as you want them to love your story so and even if it's not for us we're still gonna try to give you feedback because we know you actually paid to be here um and that's not nothing um and some people can't pay to be at these places so, like, we're really here to find great stuff. We're not here to bash you. We're not here to make you feel bad. We're all up on this pedestal, and I feel like conferences are a great way to show that agents are people. And we're goofing around. It's fine. We like to have a good time. We'll talk literary stuff with you all day. Like, we're not scary. It's okay. When you get home, do you sit down and curl up with a book that you've pulled off the shelf? If I have time. <laughs> um... I, it's really hard to do pleasure reading now. Um, I try to, uh, the most recent, like I've had a couple do not finishes lately, which I was very sad about. And one was just cause I couldn't get into the story and the other one, cause it was a huge story and I just didn't have time to get past the middle. Um, I usually like, especially at the end of the year, I try to make December my pleasure reading month. Like, and I'll take my book on like a vacation or something so I can do something other than reading client work or submissions. But it is difficult. I know I have like, over 20 submissions right now waiting in my box. And then I have all those maybes. So it's it's hard, but we try to every now and then. Well, Caitlin Johnson, this has been an absolute fun conversation. How could people get in touch with you? They can just go to the Corvisiero website. I have a profile there, and it has all of my links to Query Manager where they can submit to me. And I am all over Twitter. Like, I am just chatty everywhere. So I am approachable on Twitter. It's perfectly fine. I'm happy to meet you. I've heard Twitter is the place to be for (laughs) literary things. You get in the know. You see the book community. Yes, I I need to step up my Twitter game. (laughs) (laughs) What I think I need to do. But are you ready now to switch gears and move to our rapid fire questions? I think I'm ready. (laughs) Oh, these are going to be scary. So hold on to your seat. If you could only wear one comfortable or fashionable piece of clothing for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh my God, probably the romper I'm wearing, or the jumpsuit I'm wearing right now. It's so comfortable. (laughs) And for those of you that can't see it, it is really cute, by the way. Yeah, it's striped and it's from Express and it's great. Do you have a nickname? No, I've never been a big nickname person. Um, Anybody who tries to call me Cat or like Katie, I, I really don't do that. 
And if you could travel anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? I'd go back to Japan. I absolutely love Japan and I would definitely want to go back there immediately. Tokyo. I really loved Kyoto. Um, I love Nara, but it's country, so I know I'd want something more to do. <laughs> All right, well, Caitlin Johnson, once again, thank you so much for stopping by. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. I had a great time. This has been another edition of the Florida Writer Podcast. Allison out. After receiving a BA in writing, literature, and publishing from Emerson College, Caitlin refused to leave the concept of nightly homework behind, as well as being an associate editor for Corpus Serio Literary Agency. She is also a freelance editor at her own company, K. Johnson Editorial. For more information about Caitlin, visit her wish list at corvisario.com. For more information about the Fard Writers Association, visit us on the web at fardwriters.net.